So good evening and welcome um, and thank you all for joining us um, for the very exciting launch of the Green Surgery Challenge. Uh, we've got a lot to pack in this evening so and um, uh, I want to try and get through it all so I'll start off by just introducing who we have here on the panel. Um, so myself, uh, Victoria Pena, I am um, Royal College of England Council Member and uh, co-founder of the same sustainability and surgery um, committee we have the two presidents of the royal colleges of, of england and of edinburgh uh, professor mike griffin and professor neil mortensen we've got dr olivia bush who um, is running this so she's the clinical program director for the center for sustainable Healthcare. We've got Chantal, uh, Ms. Chantal Razan, who is um, doing a PhD um, at Brighton, looking at reducing the environmental impact of operating theatres. And we have Professor Mood Butta, who is also an ENT surgeon at Brighton and actually will be talking to us very shortly. Um, so um, I'll hand over to Professor Butta, who's um, starting this off now. And um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Vic. Um... So uh, next slide, please. So we're just going to start by um, outlining some environmental principles and the impact um, of surgical care. Um, I'm sure we're all aware of the uh, pressing need uh, to look at the environmental harms of, of human activities and surgery, of course, is included within that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So just as background, we are aware, and this is the latest report which uh, came out just a few months ago from the NHS, which shows that the carbon footprint of healthcare overall represents 4% of the complete carbon footprint of the UK. So a huge amount, really. It, it is equivalent to the total emissions of the country of Croatia. So we have really uh, uh, something to really get our teeth into here. And the NHS has set itself a very ambitious target to aim for a net zero health service by 2040. And I think we should be really proud in the UK that we've actually led the charge in taking that forward. For those of you who've got the time to read the report, it is quite brief. It's definitely worth uh, looking through and understanding some of the principles. And here's a chart you can see here on the right, which shows some of the breakdown. If you could just click and um, hopefully it will highlight. So just to highlight here within the entire carbon footprint of the NHS, Around 10% of that, for example, is medical equipment. And obviously, that's the stuff that we're buying. There is other equipment as well. That's specifically medical equipment. Click again, please. And the other thing to note here is waste and water is actually only 5%. I'm not saying that that's small, but just to give you some principles, um, the idea is that we don't need to concentrate so much on recycling, which is often what a lot of people think this is about. Recycling is only going to reduce a small percentage. If the total percentage is around 5%, even a small percent of that recycled is overall a small point. I'm not to say that recycling shouldn't be considered, but it's not one of our main aims, I think. Um, and actually trying to cut down on the number and uh, number of products that we buy is really going to be more fruitful. Next slide, please. So looking particularly within surgery, we all hopefully recognise that surgical care is um, a large throughput activity. So estimates are that the operating theatre um, is a re responsible for 20 to 30 percent of all total waste in a health system and probably has uh, three to six times more energy consumption than other, any other part of the hospital. It's the most resource intensive area. And a typical operation, depends on how you look at it, uh, is, is around 150 to 100, 170 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents. That's a common measure of the environmental impact. So that's carbon dioxide. That's the equivalent of driving from London to Edinburgh in a petrol car for a single operation. That's a typical operation. There are operations that will have less. There are operations that may be highly complex using robotics, for example, that would be much more than that. And the hotspots within surgery include energy use, Anesthetic gases, which is perhaps outside of our scope, but our, I know that our anaesthetists are working very hard on that. And in particular, consumable equipment, a lot of throughput of disposable products. Next slide, please. And so I just leave you, for my part, uh, with this quote from the NHS, uh, you know, strategy on this, which is they've got an ambitious, credible declaration to reach net zero which is, like I say, a real um, a great um, ambition for us in the UK, but it must be supported by collective action from all NHS staff. And, and I'm 
enthused to see that so many people are on this call and hopefully we can pave the way forward. I'll hand over to Chantelle now. Hi there, next slide please. Um, so hopefully now you've got a sense of some of the issues both at a national level and also specifically in terms of the contribution from surgery. Um, and so of course you've now all joined us this evening um, to find out about this Rena Surgery competition. So it's perhaps helpful to shift our focus now to look at this, the potential solutions. Um, next slide, please. And we're going to frame this in terms of the uh, sustainable surgery hierarchy. Um, this is published in a planetary health edition of the Bulletin, which is a publication by the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Um, and just to draw your attention at this point to those areas right at the bottom. So this is ordered in terms of um, the scale of impact that you might have. Uh, we'll be going through these in, in more detail, but just say at this point that actually you're going to have the biggest impact through focusing on things like surgical disease prevention and on um, engaging with patients and ensuring that any surgery that is done is truly necessary and, um, and aligned with the patient's values, rather than, as we described, um, focusing on those things right at the top, which include things like waste and recycling. Next slide, please. Um, so in order to actually reduce the environmental impact of our surgical services as a whole, let's just take a step back and actually consider that um, when well, the, the very biggest thing that we can do is to reduce the need for surgery in the first place. Carbon, uh, sorry, surgery is, of course, a very carbon intensive intervention. Um, and so we can do things such as encourage our patients to adopt healthy lifestyles, including reducing their red and processed meat consumption, encouraging the adoption of active transportation, as well as smoking cessation and alcohol moderation. And of course, all these things have got co benefits in terms of optimizing patients' uh, existing conditions, as well as part of their preoptive optimization and reducing. Uh, those risks of complications, as well as actually reducing their own environmental impact um, as individual patients. Um, and of course, when we're talking with our patients, we need to draw on those principles from choosing wisely and getting it right first time and ensure that, that the operation is truly right uh, for them. Next slide, please. So once a patient has actually entered onto that surgical pathway, we can then think about streamlining it and making sure that each step of the pathway truly adds value to the patient um, and that includes looking at the uh, the various stages within the patient pathway including those things within outpatients we should be minimizing any unnecessary appointments so for example um, if a patient is likely to have a negative result from an investigation perhaps considering um, writing to the patient as opposed to bringing them back into clinic uh, we've of course seen a widespread adoption of virtual clinics during the last year and of course my hope is that they, these will be adopted for a subset of um, patients on an ongoing basis and these have got advantages both in terms of the environmental impact as well as social advantages to the patient um, and reducing the impact on their personal lives as well as perhaps uh, their workplaces um, and the other area in which we can make reductions then is focusing on the operation itself and in particular looking at those consumables. We all need to be making sure that we don't open anything um, just in case, so really only opening things when we're sure that we're definitely going to need to use them. Um, and we can also uh, look at streamlining those pre-prepared single-use sets. Uh, so for example on the slide you see an image there from a handset used for a carpal tunnel decompression. Um, and amongst the surgeons that use that, my trust, none of them actually use those white sponges. So there's, of course, opportunities to actually liaise with our, um, our partners in industry to actually modify these pre-prepared -pre sets. Uh, but just a word of caution at this point, um, the reverse is actually true when we look at reusable sets. Um, and that's because a fixed amount of resources are used during the decontamination process per set. Um, and so typically we actually see the carbon footprint increases as reusable sets are streamlined, but certainly we should be looking at uh, streamlining those single use sets. Next slide, please. Um, so there have been a number of studies actually that have looked at this issue in terms of single use versus reusable items. Um, and these are all using life cycle assessment methodologies, which take into account all steps um, from raw, raw material extraction free to disposal, as well as things like the sterilization and the linen laundering. Um, and in all of these studies, looking at surgical instruments as well as um, surgical linens and other, other things that we use uh, in the perioperative pathway. Um, 
they're all showing that the reusables have got a, a better environmental profile. Um, and of course, we use quite a lot of single use items within things like our outpatient clinics, as well as in A&E settings. Uh, so there's plenty of opportunity to look at where we might be able to switch or uh, switch towards reusables. Next slide, please. Um, so this is now showing an image taken from um, a tonsillectomy operation, and this is uh, some of my own work looking at the consumables that we use. Um, and of course, within a tonsillectomy, we're actually using a reusable set, um, but that uh, contributes just 16% of the carbon footprint, and the, the whole carbon footprint is really dominated by the uh, production of those single-use items. Um, and the purpose of me showing you this slide is to highlight that actually there's sometimes just a few uh, things that really do um, uh, take up that the lion's share. Um, and in this case, it was the suction tubing, the table drape, the sterile gloves, as well as the patient drape. Um, and so when you're trying to think about where, uh, where your efforts might be best spent, focusing on some of those um, large and bulky single use items would be a really good place to start. Next slide, please. So we thought about um, reduction and uh, and reuse, but as part of that, we can also think about um, extending the lifespan through things like repair, repair and reprocessing. Um, now, most hospitals have actually got repair contracts in place, but these are really underutilized often. Um, the picture that you see on the slide there is uh, just of some scissors being repaired. It's really quick and easy to do, and it actually uh, doubles the lifespan, and it can be done up to 10 times. Um, so we're able to really maximize our use um, of these resources for, uh, for encouraging things like repair. Reprocessing is something that's more commonly done in the States. Uh, there's a little bit more in terms of the regulation in, in the UK, uh, but certainly it'd be really interesting to have some projects look at, looking at um, increasing the use of repair services. Next slide, please. So we've already alluded to the fact that actually, oh, sorry, there's a slow transition there. Um, we've already spoken about the issues in relation to waste and actually um, it's estimated that only around four or five percent of the carbon footprint of healthcare is um, attributed to the waste itself. But it is important that we do get it right. Um, and this slide is then showing that there's a 50 fold impact in terms of the difference between um, the highest carbon waste stream versus the lowest, um, as you'd expect, recycling then has a 50 fold lower carbon footprint as opposed to high temperature incineration. So it's important that we get this right, um, but it's not our focus within sustainable surgery. Next slide, please. So we've We've now gone through then a framework in which you can think about the areas that you might have the um, biggest impact. Um, so I'd now like to hand you back over to, to Victoria, who's going to um, now br bring us on to some other ele elements of today's session. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chantal and Mood, for that. Um, and, and I just wanted to mention, actually, we also have dialed in um, John Dade, who's president of the Association for Periop Practitioners, and Mike Donnellan, who is chair of the College of ODPs, which is really fantastic because um, we all know that to make changes and come up with new ideas, we all have to work together as a, a multidisciplinary team. So I'm really D delighted to say that. Um, I'm now going to hand over to um, the presidents of the, 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 the two Royal Colleges that are here. I'll start with Neil if that's okay and then we'll come on to you Mike. Yes thanks very much Vix and thanks Chantel and Mood for those presentations. I think it's fair to say that the colleges have been somewhat diverted by Covid in the last few months understandably but of course climate change continues apace uh, and it can't be ignored and it will be still a very big challenge when we get the other side of COVID. So we're absolutely delighted to partner with the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare for this Green Surgery Challenge. I think it's such a brilliant idea. I think it's so exciting. It's great. And um, the Royal College of Surgeons of England with Vix initiative has its own uh, sustainability and surgery group now. And um, I think it would be fair to say that I'm also absolutely delighted to share this with Mike Griffin this evening. There is absolutely no room for intercollegiate rivalry or competition on this one. We all inhabit the same planet. So on this one, we really are all in it together. Mike. 
Thanks, Neil, and thanks, Vic, and thanks, Chantal and Mood, for setting the scene. Um, it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to, to be here tonight, sharing the Royal College of Surgeons of England's webinar. Um, I think we heard from Chantal and Mood just how much um, surgeons, anaesthetists, um, the surgical team and the operating theatres contribute to the carbon footprint, and it's frightening. And so uh, this green surgical challenge, which was sold to me by Vic um, a while ago, is just a wonderful idea, as, as Neil said. And, and the added bonus of a prize at the end of it is, uh, is just ingenious. And it's a pity we hadn't um, had this 35 years ago when Neil and I were training. Well, 40 years in Neil's case. Um, 45 in your case. <laughs> Uh, when we were training, because actually joking apart, I'm serious about it because um, uh, it, it would have made a, a hell of a difference. And it's not too late, uh, but there's no time to lose. And uh, it's just great that we're doing this on a bicollegiate basis. And uh, well done, Vic, in making it happen. Congratulations to all of you for putting the Green Surgical Challenge to all of us. Thank you so much and thank you again for, for us all working together to make this happen. I'm so delighted. Um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Dr. Livia Bush, who's just going to tell us a little bit more about what this challenge actually is. Thank you, Vic. Next slide, please. Wonderful. So I'm going to take you through the different steps of the Green Surgery Challenge so you understand how it works. Um, but before I do that, I just want to give you a brief overview of, of the history and how this has come about. Um, so this is actually sprung out of um, a successful programme that the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare has been running within healthcare organisations for about um, eight years now, um, called the Green Ward Competition, um, with a similar structure. But this, what is different about this competition is that um, we've been able to take it to a national level and we're just focusing on one specialty, so surgery, because there's a particular appetite um, and a sense that we need to create some fresh case studies to and create capability within the community to, um, to really transform surgical care to become um, more environmentally, uh, reduce the environmental impact of surgery. Um, and what has enabled us to do that really is, is support from our sponsors and partners. So we have our gold funder is the um, NIHR MedTech Cooperative in Surgical Technologies, um, which undertakes research to facilitate the pull through of new technologies into the NHS for patient benefit. We also have um, a gold sponsor, Elemental Healthcare, and um, they aim to take waste out of the system by using reusable elements in their surgical instruments. Um, and of course, we have our, our silver sponsors, which are the Royal College of uh, Surgeons England and Royal College of Surgeons Edinburgh. Um, so we're delighted to have a professional bodies uh, as sponsors as well. So um, to start off kind of how the cycle of the challenge works. Um, I, um, so next slide, please. Here we are at the at the launch. This, this is an opportunity really to raise um, awareness um, amongst the community and provide a resource so um, you can share this um, video afterwards with, um, with others who might be interested. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then, of course, the, we'll move on to uh, the recruitment phase, which is opening um, next week. Next slide, please. So next week on the 10th of February, which is next Wednesday, uh, recruitment will open. You'll be able to submit your applications uh, until the 1st of March. Um, there's an online application form and um, on that you need to, you need, you'll need to put together a team. Um, you need two, two team leads and the project, you need to put together some project ideas and outline an environmental hotspot in your surgical service so the information that Chantal has given you will be really helpful um, to frame that um, and think about a problem that you'd like to tackle. Um, this form can be found on the on uh, the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare's website so you've got the link there but it's, it's easy to find if you just google it um, and there'll also be an applicant's guide there which will give you a bit more detail on um, the kind of projects that we're looking for and uh, your, your approach um, and also some extra resources. Um, and I'll just take you through a few of those now, which could, which could help you as you prepare. Um, so next slide, please. 
So one of those is a toolkit. Um, this is sustainability in quality improvement. So uh, we recognise that uh, quality improvement is a really powerful way to, um, a as a mechanism for change, um, particularly in healthcare, but throughout industry as well. Um, and we've devised a method which incorporates sustainability into that as well. So it's a really useful toolkit. We, uh, I would, I would um, commend that to you. Um, next slide, please. And there are also some courses, um, and these are available for people whether or not you're on the, uh, you decide to apply or not. But there is one on sustainable quality improvement um, this month, and um, there's a carbon footprinting for health that Chantelle um, teaches on as well. Next slide, please. Um, and there's also a sustainable operating theatres network, which is really useful for putting ideas out there and finding out what other people are doing and sharing case studies at that point as well. So it could be useful in pre preparing. Next slide, please. So um, when we're look when we're looking at these ideas, it's really useful to look at this um, this guide, thinking about what is sustainable value. So looking at those three areas, looking at um, improvements that are good for good for the planet, because obviously that is the that is the focus of this competition. Good socially, so good for people, whether that's um, patients, obviously, um, but also but also staff. Um, and then financially, so the public purse we put down there. Um, and really just remembering as well that all these areas obviously need to, to balance up. We're not asking you to do something that is environmentally sustainable, but to the detriment of uh, the rest of the, the rest of care. It's about creating um, creating a good balance there. Thank you. Next slide, please. So um, once, the, um, once people have, have submitted their applications, there'll be a short list and uh, it will as a competitive process and six teams will be, will be, will be chosen. Um, and those teams will be, um, will be given a, uh, will, will be attending workshops. Next slide, please. So these online workshops will run um, between the 26th and 29th of April um, and you will receive project coaching from the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare to, um, to, to, to develop your project and sort of signpost you to useful resources as well. Next, the next slide, please. Excellent. And then, of course, once you've once you've had that workshop, there'll be a period of mentoring. Again, um, our, our organisation will will help you in uh, help help the successful applicants to run their project and gather the right data. Next slide, please. So the sort of things that we'll be helping with are um, sustainability knowledge um, or sustainable surgery knowledge, carbon footprinting. Um, it's an opportunity to work with our um, carbon footprinter. He's very experienced in working um, uh, on the ground with people. So it's uh, in, in healthcare. So she, she understands the terrain. Um, and we, we collaborate together. Um, but she also, she also knows how to not do a research level carbon footprint, but do something that's workable in practice. Um, mentoring on clinical leadership and um, networking for sustainable surgery. So just picking up on what Victoria was saying, there's a set of relationships and people that it's useful to connect with to make sustainable surgery happen. So we'll be advising you on that as well. Uh, next slide, please. And then by the 15th of July, um, it's time for submitting projects. Um, so there'll be a, your, the, the, the applicants will put given a project write-up um, the raw data for verification in addition to their um, data interpretation um, and photos um, just so that the for, for good publicity. Um, next slide, slide please. Um, and then there was, there was a period of um, uh, data verification and getting ready for the judging and awards which will take place in, um, in November this year. Um, so this will be a, a high profile event and every um, each one of those six teams will have the opportunity to present um, their projects to a panel of judges um, and um, and there will be yeah, there'll, there'll, there'll be an audience, there'll be plenty of publicity around that um, to really raise the profile of the types of projects um, that are going to be helpful and um, uh, to demonstrate um, how, how change could happen and to aspire to aspire more action going forward. Um, and then of course, next slide please. Um, the winners will receive seed funding for their, their um, sustainable surgery project. So uh, at the moment that um, is, is 500 pounds that we've got set for that. Um, and then following that, next slide please, uh, we'll be sharing the success and those case studies more widely and disseminating um, that knowledge.
so that's the cycle of the Green Surgery Challenge, starting from now at the launch right through till next next November with the judging awards and the um, and the sharing of those case studies and, and, and really generating, not, not only raising awareness, building capability and a movement really around sustainability within the, um, within the surgical community to sort of catalyze action in this area. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Good. So we're going to be moving on now, um, Chantal and I, to um, some case studies, um, really to illustrate some of the uh, to give you a, a flavour really of the kind of the kind of projects that you might consider um, to, to give you to give you a sense of how the principles that Chantal has discussed and I've mentioned as well can be put into action. Um, and some of these are study uh, case studies from the Green Green Board competition that I've been working on with frontline staff um, as well. So that will give you a sense of it'd be a very similar process to, to this one. Thank you, Chantal. I think you're leading with the first case study. Great, next slide please. Um, so we're going to start off by um, uh, just bringing you back to that sustainable value equation. Um, so certainly when thinking about um, the projects that you might want to take forward within this, it's really helpful from the very uh, start to just balance the patient population outcomes against the triple bottom line. Um, next slide please. And we're going to start off by thinking about a, um, a case that focuses on um, on that very uh, bottom of, of that hierarchy. So looking at the um, preoperative pre optimization. Next slide, please. And of course, this is an area where you can have a lot of impact. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a graphic that's taken from our uh, a piece written by our colleague um, Scarlett McNally, who's um, an orthopaedic surgeon down in Eastbourne. Um, and here she highlights the uh, the real benefits that you can have um, in reducing complications through some very low carbon interventions. So um, here she's like that actually um, through smoking cessation each week, week on week, uh, there's a almost 20% um, reduction in terms of the complication rate. Um, whilst regular exercise can actually reduce the uh, rates of pulmonary complications by up to 50%. Um, and of course, just bear in mind, these are low carbon interventions in terms of uh, promoting these healthy behaviours, um, but the treatment of any complications would be really carbon intensive in and of themselves. Um, there's a bit of a paucity of research in this area in terms of the uh, framing these in, in, in terms of sustainability terms. Um, and there's not very well thought through um, uh, case studies either. Uh, um, so it'd be really, really interesting actually to um, think about developing projects within this field, but quantifying the uh, the benefits that, that might then have in terms of the triple bottom line. So the um, environmental, financial and, and social uh, sustainability elements and, and applying these to some of these uh, more patient uh, disease prevention and patient education measures. Um, and I think this is a really important area uh, and especially in light of COVID, um, and the delays that we're seeing in, op uh, in operating, I think that some projects that are focusing on the disease prevention and, and patient education uh, would be really powerful. So I'm going to hand you over to Olivia now for the next case. Thank you, Chantal. Um, next slide, please. Excellent. So um, the second case study is around improved, uh, improved surgical consent process. Next slide, please. Um, so this was a case, in fact, from um, ophthalmology. Um, so the, the situation was that um, the nursing staff, in fact, had noted that for cataract surgery, there was a unusually high number of patients having um, undergoing a procedure under general anaesthetic rather than local anaesthetic. Um, and they also were finding that um, at a later stage, they were able to reassure, a lot of patients were very anxious, but they were able to reassure them. And at a late stage, you got a lot of conversions to local anaesthetic um, and so we're wondering this did this still cause some waste in the system which I can out, well, I'll outline later when we come to the results um, and so they looked as a team about so how they could how they could tackle this um, and they took three actions and next slide please so um, so the, um, the anaesthetic colleagues and surgical colleagues got together for an education session to discuss the um, the key issues that came up with patients and how what the what the really 
key indications were for general general anesthetic, general anesthetic. Um, they also looked at the actual conversation and consent process within within the consultation and um, it was it was discussed about eliciting and addressing the patient concerns which was often around a fear of blindness at that stage uh, which would allay the patient's anxieties and lead to less problems with needing a general anaesthetic at that point um, and they also followed up with a, a new patient information leaflet which, which was clear um, clear on the risks of the risks and the um, of, of surgery um, and following a sort of a three whys so if, if a patient was listed for a general anaesthetic for that to be questioned at three uh, main points within the pathway by all members of the team. Next slide, please. And the, the, the benefits of this were pretty significant, really. Um, so from an environmental perspective, um, you can imagine with the uh, conversion from general to um, local, you, you're using less equipment and, of course, anaesthetic gas use as well. So that equated to 1,000, well, nearly 2,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent annually. Um, and then, of course, if uh, patients are having a general, sometimes they have to have a hospital visit um, to come up for preoperative assessment, which might involve investigation. So you have an extra, and that also has a carbon footprint um, based upon sort of, um, uh, which is a, a sort of composite value, which which has been devised. Um, so and that, so that actually, that uh, saving that actually saves again almost nearly uh, two thousand kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent annually. And of course, this knocks on to financial savings as well. Um, in, in all those areas, but this is, is the savings in equipment, um, saving staff time and improving the flow through theatres. Um, if you took that all together, actually there was going to be a forecast uh, savings of, um, of uh, 161,000 um, annually, um, which was just for just one unit was, was, was pretty impressive. Um, they also found some social benefits as well. So for the team, um, there was improved understanding of each other's roles and improved team working. Uh, for patients, they didn't need to have um, uh, someone coming with them to accompany them post-procedure. And of course, it saved patient time as well. Next slide, please. Um, so just to reiterate, this this ticked a dump, uh, this this um, made a number of impacts at different different elements of the triangle. So of course, you've got the um, the patient being involved in their in their care and their um, a better conversation between the um, the surgeon and the patient. Um, the, you had lean service delivery, so you've got you've got that, that better flow through theatres um, and less use of equipment, and of course low carbon treatment options as well, moving away from the um, the, the general anaesthetic to a, low, a lower carbon option. Thank you. So next slide, please. I'll move back. Um, I, think, I think it's just me. The next yeah, next case study. So the next case study is um, pioneering early mobilisation in the cardiac intensive care unit. Next slide, please. So this was a project carried out in Southampton Hospital um, and prior to the project there was no therapy um, assistance um, working at all in the cardiac intensive care unit. Um, so as part of the project um, they instigated um, therapy sessions for all patients twice a day, half an hour, um, either active through a mobilisation or passive using a motorised movement therapy device. Next slide please. Oh, sorry, next. Uh, sorry, go back. If you could go back, please. I didn't see it change. <laughs> so, and the, the um, results were rather impressive. So, we had reduced ventilation days by four days, and the overall, the um, cardiac intensive care stay was reduced by uh, six days. Next slide, please. So you can imagine the change, the, the savings were pretty enormous. So over two years, uh, the total savings was 48.5 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. So um, just to kind of quantify, give a sense of that, for each individual, for the average UK resident, you use about um, 10 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent over a whole year. So uh, you get a sense of that is, that is a large saving. Um, so and financially, the total savings were um, yeah, over, a, over a million pounds over two years. Um, obviously, big social social benefits as well. So more rapid recovery for patients. They had a quicker discharge home to their families and were able to return to their activities of daily living um, much um, much more quickly, which improved sort of patient autonomy and increased well-being and a sense of control. And it also increased the staff satisfaction enormously. Uh, next slide, please. So 
So, um, so again, this, this um, has a number of impacts as well across the um, patient empowerment, lean service delivery and low carbon treatment options. Next slide, please. And I'll hand back to Chantal at this point. Great, thank you, Olivia. Next slide, please. Um, so we're going to finish off, finish off now with a final case, which is focusing on one of those low carbon alternatives, looking at um, an easy example where you can make a switch from um, single use items to reusables without having uh, impact at all on the, the patient themselves. Um, next slide, please. So this is uh, based on uh, some of my own work, looking at uh, the packaging systems that we're using for sterilization of reusable sets. Um, and as you'll be aware, those can either be packaged and housed in um, reusable rigid containers, such as the ascolap tins on the bottom, or um, they're typically double wrapped actually, then in, a, in, in the polypropylene wraps that you see at the top. Um, and uh, within this analysis, I was able to show that the carbon footprint of the reusables, uh, the actual container itself, it was about a quarter uh, that of the single use items and also half the cost. Um, now the, the situation is even worse than when we think about wrapping um, reusable instruments as individually wrapped items, so as supplementary items. And in that instance, they're then typically double wrapped, but in single use polyethylene wraps, um, which you see in the middle. Um, and I was able to demonstrate that actually that meant there was then a four times higher carbon footprint uh, from the sterilization process um, due to doing them as individually wrapped items as opposed to um, preparing sets as trays. Um, and that's partly because of the wrap, but also because of the way in which the actual um, decontamination machines are loaded. Next slide, please. So as I've described, there's some clear advantages in terms of the environmental impact and the carbon footprint, uh, but it's also helpful to um, think about these in terms of uh, the financial benefits. Um, and this was actually demonstrated within a, a US hospital, which uh, switched all of their reusable sets to using rigid containers exclusively. And they were able to demonstrate savings of around 51,000 US dollars each year. Um, so really significant savings. Um, the other thing that we haven't touched on at the, uh, so far is that within um, social sustainability, we think about the impact on the lives of patients as well as our staff. Um, but we've also got to think further up the, uh, the supply chain as well. Um, and we've got evidence of labour rights abuses within healthcare supply chains and particularly in those areas where we've got um, uh, high volume, low cost items uh, such as single, single use items. So um, when we're thinking about making switches uh, to, to, to single use, then there may be social benefits there as well to consider. So over to you, Victoria, that's the end of the cases. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Right, we've got some time left now where we can go to questions and um, uh, and and keep them coming in, and we'll try and get through them if we can. Um, actually, one of the first questions that's uh, 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 come in that's quite interesting is um, someone said that some of the pathways listed earlier have been known for years, and nothing's happening. It's not happening. Um, the NHS has made promises in the past about targets and did they reach their targets and why would it be different this time? And I will open that up to the panellists here, but I would like to say um, um, that we're, we, we're, we're not speaking on behalf of the NHS, even though we're employees of the NHS and we're users of the NHS. But I do think that there is that there is a sea of change happening and now now is the time and we need to ride on this 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 wave and make it happen and if we feel that it's not happening possibly from the top then we need to make it happen on the shop floor and it's doing these webinars it's having these types of um, competitions and challenges it's taking it into our own hands because if we always wait for people to do it higher up but it, it may not come at the speed that we want um, and I can't even and I'm not someone that's able to comment on that so so by even doing this we are helping to make these changes so why will it be different this time there is an appetite for change and I think it's coming and we just need to make it happen and some of the things that um, Chantal has alluded to uh, you know the, the horrendous the horrendous um, impact 
the NHS actually has on the, um, the carbon footprint uh, and that, that huge amounts of this comes from the surgical side and huge amounts of this comes from single use items. It makes me think that there's not really a place in the future for companies that are producing these single use items because that is not the future. That is not what's going to be sustainable. So it's just worth thinking about and maybe th that type of thing can be incorporated in some of the projects that are put forward. But uh, it, would anyone else like to uh, answer anything um, in relation to that from the panelists has anyone else got anything Chantel yeah so I, I do think it's hugely encouraging that we have had this release of the uh, net zero report by the greener NHS team so um, as we described the NHS has actually um, set this hugely ambitious um, target of becoming the first national health service globally to reach uh, to reach net zero um, so we, there is within that a, um, a strategy, but there's been a huge expansion of their team and, and um, I think it's very encouraging all of the work that is being done at a national level across uh, at an NHS level. Um, and it has been um, great to have been part of that journey as well with the, with the Royal College in terms of um, the foundation of the Sustainability and Surgery Working Group. Um, and I know that the other colleges also have, uh, they are developing sustainability strategies. So I think we have seen a, a large transition over this last couple of years um, in terms of our top down leadership towards sustainability. Um, and alongside that, I think there has been a, a, a change on the ground also in terms of uh, the number of people that are actually um, aware of issues in relation to our negative impact uh, on, on our environment and many um, people within the workplace are doing things now in their personal lives that they wouldn't have done five years ago um, and I, I, I do think that um, uh, as a nation we are on a journey towards improving the sustainability uh, of, of our day-to-day -day lives um, and that that has actually accelerated quite significantly over this last year. Mm. Thank you Chantal. Mood or Olivia? Neil? Um, yeah, I, was, I mean, obviously, I was going to echo those sentiments. I think we have got a field change. I think we've got good, strong leadership that this is the way forward. I think there's still obviously going to be some frustration on the shop floor. Um, you know, I, I, uh, Olivia may not know this, but I was there 15 years ago when this crazy idea of a centre for sustainable healthcare was being mooted in Oxford. So, um, yeah, um, it's nothing new for me. So I've been waiting 15 years for this moment, too. Um, I think this is about moral leadership. So, you know, we must not forget that we are leaders as well. And don't think that everyone in the NHS is against you because that's not what the surveys have shown. We have surveys from the NHS that have shown that I think they, when they last surveyed, 98% of people in the healthcare system believe that climate change should be something that the health system should be caring about. It's just a matter of time and systems that are the same old, the same old. And it's about, actually, if you show moral leadership, people will come with you, I think. It's just getting through all the barriers, which is frustrating and difficult, but actually that's what we have to do. We don't have a choice. Yeah. Mm. Olivia? Yeah, I suppose I wanted to, um, I, I agree with both both of what Chantal and Buda said. I suppose I want to um, offer an encouragement, really. I mean, the policy policy change is really encouraging. It can help set the tone, can't it? But in the end, it comes, it comes down to um, people taking responsibility for their, their own areas. Obviously, you need you do need both. You obviously need to engage your senior leadership. But um, I suppose this is part. And I have seen through working with you know um, through with with clinicians working on the front line, um, people people making changes that that have impact. Um, and through this and through this kind of initiative, that they're, they're, they're able to showcase that as well, which starts to to senior leadership, and it does start to change culture. Um, I'd like to see it far, happening faster and more dramatically um, and far from further reaching. Um, but um, but I think I think it's if, if we can uh, equip people and give them that sense of um, agency, um, then then that, that that is a gift to people. I think people then take on. Um, Take on that knowledge, take on the agency, and um, you know, start start moving things forward. And that's that's what I hope this is going to do. Actually, start really building a really much bigger movement in surgery towards this, which would gain gain momentum. Thank you. Yes, and Neil, I saw you said you wanted to say something. Oh, we can't hear. Oh. I think we've he's lost. Having, he's having difficulty unmuting himself. I think. 
Right, there we are, that's better. I was muted by the organiser, I'm sorry. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Vic. It's about timing, number one, and actually the timing is brilliant because, of course, with COVID, the NHS has been looking at its supply chains. It's been looking mm -hmm. at all those things around being an independent provider for our own, if you like, hospitals from our own industries and from our own providers. So that's a massive, massive opportunity. I think the other thing is, um, all these big institutions, they respond to pressure. Eventually, they respond to pressure. And that's what this is all about. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. I agree. Um, we've got some more questions coming in. Uh, actually, this is just a simple one. Um, can medical students get involved, Olivia? Um, well, they could get involved. Uh, it's the the those leading the the project leads need to be um, need to be those in practice. So um, they, they yeah they need to be people in practice. But by all means, you could you could go uh, go back to your hospital where you're working and tell people about it, um, and you know, get get people get people excited about it. Um, that's it's partly actually because we. We are very keen for any projects to be carried out to be fully embedded, um, and we know that um, trainees and students are, are, one, are, are marvellous in getting in getting people. Well, um, junior trainees, obviously, with your surgical training, you're you're absolutely eligible. But um, great at getting people on board. But of course, you move on quite quickly, so it's it's important to get people engaged who are actually going to be who can who will who will stay in that department and can embed those changes and carry them forward. So it's all about team working. So by all means, go back and get involved. Um, um, but you'll need to get other people to be your project leads. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Uh, a question for Chantal, um, I think you might know the answer. Has anyone looked at the reusable tray wraps versus the rigid containers? I think you have um, looked at that, haven't you? Yeah, so this actually forms a chapter of my PhD thesis, um, and we've recently submitted it uh, for, for publication. Um, and as I said uh, earlier on, um, so that was based on my own work, in fact, uh, the carbon footprint of the reusable containers is about a quarter that of the single use tray wrap, so really significant benefits there. Um, and I know the trust next door uh, to where I am here, uh, they use exclusively those um, double wrapped uh, polypropylene blue wraps. Um, but they're all manufactured to the same sterility assurance standards. Um, so there's no real reason as to why we we can't switch then to the to the reusable alternatives. Yeah, thank you. And um, is there any information on the use of water and associated chemicals for reprocessing and its effects on the environment? I might redirect that to you again, if that's okay. Yeah, so um, it actually forms the same uh, study or, or part of the same study. So I, I have. Um, the field of sustainable surgery is really in its infancy um, as an academic area and so when I came to try to um, actually do research within this field I found that actually uh, we don't have um, good emission factors and, and, and uh, evidence in terms of the environmental impact of sterilization um, and so I have done that work myself in terms of collecting the primary data on that um, so uh, you'll have to wait for the publication um, with basic breath on the on the carbon footprint of, of sterilization uh, services, but hopefully that will be um, accepted in, in the in the coming months and will be a, a useful source for anyone who's wanting to look at those environmental impacts of, of instrument decontamination. Thank you. Okay, um, Mood, I'm going to direct this towards you. How does the carbon footprint of the NHS compare with, for example, the law, the government, or Amazon? And and the second part of that question, uh, uh, I'll open up. How can COVID and infection control reduce? Um, how will COVID and infection control reduce the appetite from policymakers around reusables? Uh, and that, that that's quite relevant. And actually, um, Neil might talk a little bit about that he's mentioned it before uh, over to you mood for that if that's okay okay um first of all i'd say it's actually very difficult to get an absolute accurate carbon footprint of anything you know, and Chantel will tell you it's a huge amount of work so let's not let's be realistic here and let's not say that we can carbon footprint everything if we were to carbon footprint everything to understand the minutiae of what we need to do the planet will be dead by the time we've done that we can make some estimates of what these sort of uh, effects are by looking at spend which is correlates roughly um, I, I believe to carbon footprint so yeah uh, uh, so I saw that question come up I've looked at some of the data so yeah Amazon is a single 
largest producer, uh, sorry, single largest uh, retail outlet, 280 billion US dollars. The NHS spend is 114 billion pounds, which is about 150 billion dollars. So actually, it's pretty high up there in comparison to Amazon. And obviously, with Amazon, uh, I'm not singling out a particular company here, I have to be clear, but that's actually about individual responsibility. Yes, people should buy less, and, and we can do that. Unless we're going to say we're going to stop all healthcare, we're not, we, we can't apply the same principles to what we're doing. Uh, and we can't also use excuses by saying, well, someone else is doing it, so we don't have to. In terms of overall government expenditure, there's no doubt that the health system is probably the single largest area of spend of within government. So it's it, in the UK, it's about seven and a half, eight percent of gross domestic product. Total government expenditure is about a, a third of gross domestic product. So yes, it's not a huge amount overall, but it's a single biggest area of spend. So we absolutely have a responsibility, and we and it's fantastic that the NHS is probably the only section of government that's actually tried to quantify this uh, in quite so much depth and intensity. So it's not to say that others can't be responsible. We're all responsible and we've all got to do this. So. Thank you. Um, and with the, with the second part of that question, how will COVID and this, this, this big thing we talked about before on other webinars, um, it, it, since infection can control came in and, and um, people have sold to us that actually it's um, better to have a single use straight because of infection when actually the evidence is not that it's better for infection, it's the same as having a reusable drape and, and um, uh, how we need to have poli policy make a change and, and it's how, how we go about doing that um, and I that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I wonder if Olivia, Chantal, Neil, you'd like to comment? Might start with you, yeah, so I, I think this is a really, um, this is an area that we do need to uh, really tackle head on. Um, mm. Of course, the single use um, culture has largely uh, risen due to infection control um, uh, scares as such, uh, but a lot of the time that's not um, necessarily founded in, an, in a true evidence basis. So we need to have um, a systematic evaluation of the risk of these single use items um, and then to balance that then against the um, environment, the impact of the environment on on human health um so the lancet commission actually posed climate change as the greatest threat to human health of the 21st century and that's through a number of direct and indirect um impacts um the largest environmental um cause of uh of death is from air pollution we see seven million excess deaths each year globally as a result of um air pollution um and so I, I, I think we need to essentially um, do a better job at quantifying the risk associated with those single use, but then also uh, quantify that and, and balance it against uh, the, the risk from the uh, the environmental harms that are then associated with those single use items. Okay, mm. thank you very much. Olivia, have you got any comments about that? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I can, I can see practically that infection control measures sometimes can be uh, well often do become barriers um but they can be overcome as well um and i know chantal's been doing some work as well but the, one of the hot topics i suppose is, is ppe um and we are seeing efforts towards uh, some success um towards developing uh, reusable ppe um as well at the moment so just i just thought it is in something very topical that is going on at the moment thank you neil i'm just going to duck we, we had another question come through um, uh, it says what methods will the Royal College um, use to encourage members to insist on low carbon devices being supplied the, the system responds to pressure they put so what methods will the Royal College use to encourage members to insist on low carbon devices being supplied uh, I think we're all in the business of, uh, of nudging and influencing organisations, the surgical community within the college, uh, colleague to colleague, uh, at a national level too. Um, I think, I mean, part of the problem here is, let's just go back to the PPE thing. You remember at the height of the COVID pandemic, everybody was really, really personally interested about their own safety. And you could be logical about what worked and what didn't work, but actually people were terrified and they wanted what they thought was the best. So that wasn't the time to sort out 
what was good in terms of either reusable or single use or whatever. So those kinds of issues have to wait for there to be a time of, um, if you like, peace, calm and stability when it can be looked at in the cold light of day. And um, I think we will get out of this clearly and there will be lots and lots of things we'll be talking about when COVID is over to a degree. Uh, and this will be one of the areas we'll say, what have we learned from the, if you like, the surge of the pandemic in terms of reusable use or not? And uh, how can we then go on and apply this to our surgical practice in the future? And there'll be lots and lots of discussions around that, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, and probably our last question now, I'm afraid, I don't think we can get through them all. Um, do you think, this is, I'm going to open this up to the panel, do you think sustainability will be one of the parameters when purchasing new equipment in the future? Um, are there green targets that ally with GERFT and are pro procurement teams aware and invested in it? That's a lot to get through. I'm going to, I'm going to direct that to Chantal and we'll see if we can answer that in, in a minute or two before we wrap up. <laughs> um, so I think there's certainly movement in that direction at a national level um, and I know that the, the Greener Surgery Group are looking at um, trying to define some of those parameters by which we can actually uh, measure sustainability and to actually include them then within the tendering process um, and uh, I, I think of course in an ideal world we would see that uh, when awarding contracts it is on the basis of that sort of sustainable value framework um, and actually that uh, we do take into account all elements of the triple bottom lines so I think within a healthcare context we're very used to um, thinking about the uh, the patients and the wider populations, um, as well as the the financial implications, but those elements that are often overlooked are the social and the environmental aspects. Um, they're very challenging in terms of actually trying to, uh, to put up put, put any sort of meaningful quantification on these, uh, which are then comparable. Um, but I think in the in the coming um, few years, certainly, then we will see. Um, a requirement on industry to actually show that they are at least considering um, their environmental impact. Absolutely, absolutely. And I hope that does happen. Now, just to get back to the Greener Surgery Challenge. Now, um, Olivia, have you got any parting tips maybe for people? Um, you've done this kind of thing before. Um, and um, I wonder if you can give us any sort of insider tips maybe for people wishing to apply. Yes, certainly. I'd love to. Um, yes, I think uh, I think one of the pitfalls sometimes is to is to kind of just rush in with a solution, you know, an idea that you've got. You just think, oh, this is this is what we need to do. And I think what we're what we're looking for in this is to get people just to step back and just uh, take a moment to think a little, a little bit differently and think about their department um, and the whole pathway, the whole surgical pathway, who's involved and where those where the areas, the hotspots might be, the environmental and also the social, but particularly the environmental hotspots and that, and really tackle those and really think about where they can have most most impact. So we've all got limited time um, and thinking about as well, kind of where your team, how what, what expertise have they got that they can, um, that makes them the best people to to tackle this problem. So I think, I think some strategic thinking around that, making, keeping the carbon, the environmental hotspots very much at the centre of making those decisions. Um, Measure your baselines. Uh, no rushing in and making um, making changes with them without checking what your baseline is first. Um, yeah, and and I I think probably putting together a, a good uh, having a, two really good team leads. I think who sort of bring people together and very good at engaging uh, more widely both both within a, a team but also within the organisation. I think are very key. Um, and finally, just you know something something you're really passionate about. Um, but I haven't said that first because um, it's uh, it's good to have some structure to that passion. So all those things I think are going to make a really um, a really good project, and uh, we're really looking forward to receiving the applications. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It's been a really, really wonderful webinar. I mean, it could go on forever. We've got so many questions coming through and it sounds like we probably need to uh, organise another webinar, with, you know, to open up and answer all these questions in the future. It's obviously stuck, uh, an area that lots of people are passionate about. We've had a huge number of attendees. This will be recorded as well and you'll be able to watch it on the Royal College of England's web website. Um, and um, good luck to anyone that's going to apply. Uh, it will be opening next week and then you've got 
three weeks before it closes. So make sure you get your applications in during that time. Uh, once the deadline's closed, it's closed. So good luck to everyone. And thank you all for uh, all the panelists here for, for giving up your time this evening to talk about this and um, everyone that's attended. Thank you very much. Goodbye from us all. Thank you.